Hello and welcome to EWTM Pro-Life Weekly, your weekly dose of the top pro-life news and issues from a Catholic perspective. I'm Katherine Seltner in our Washington, D.C. studio. Here's what we have planned for you in this show. A judge rules a teen girl declared brain dead three years ago may still be alive. We bust the myth pro-lifers are only pro-birth and introduce you to an alternative way to receive health care that's pro-life and pro-family. But first, our top story, Kentucky could become the first U.S. state without an abortion clinic in our modern era. EMW Women's Surgical Center is the state's last abortion clinic. The facility is challenging a Kentucky law that requires abortion clinics have agreements with a hospital and an ambulance service in case of medical emergencies. The high stakes trial ended last week, but the decision on whether Kentucky becomes an abortion clinic free state could take months. Kentucky State Representative Adia Wushner of District 66 chairs the state's House Standing Committee on Health, Welfare and Family Services. She is a retired healthcare executive, bioethicist, and nurse, and joins us now from Bowling Green, Kentucky. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Catherine. I'd like to hit on one of Kentucky's abortion clinic requirements, transfer agreements to hospitals. Why is that necessary in your opinion? Well, I think it's, it's a standard of care for health care. It's, it's not just for abortion clinics in, in the Commonwealth of Kentucky, but it would be for an ambulatory surgery center and other clinics that those facilities would have a transfer or what may be called a linkage agreement so that when an emergency, if it occurs, that they have an agreement with an ambulance service and also a hospital that would receive that patient in case of an emergency. This is just, this is standard of care. This is good health care practice and uh, whether you're a, a man or a woman or a child in a health care facility, uh, I feel that women receiving their care in an abortion clinic, you know, deserve the same standard of care. As a nurse, can you speak to why there needs to be elevated health standards for women? Well, I, you know, being very pro-woman, I believe woman needs the same standard of care, excellent care, no matter where she's receiving her services. When a woman's making such a uh, fundamental decision in her life, she may not be thinking about, does this facility have this standard of care? Those should be a given for her. And it's important for women that they deserve the same excellence of care that anyone in the Commonwealth of Kentucky uh, would receive, no matter where they're uh, seeking their medical treatment. What services are available to women in Kentucky who find themselves in an unexpected pregnancy with little to no financial support? Of course, uh, through Medicaid services, uh, uh, the basic Medicaid services, all women are entitled to pregnancy and child care services and maternal health care services through federal Medicaid programs and dollars that come into the Commonwealth of Kentucky. A woman who at first finds out that she's pregnant may seek her services through one of our public health departments, a crisis pregnancy center, or through a federally funded uh, community health service. So there's a vast uh, array of services in communities throughout the Commonwealth that are available to women. Kentucky this year has been successfully passing a number of pro-life legislation. What's the strategy been? Well, we began uh, our session in January with a, with a new team. Uh, for the first time in almost 100 years, uh, Republicans uh, took the House majority, a super majority. And so before we began the session, uh, House leadership, Senate leadership, uh, in working together, put, through, put forth an idea on bills that we have long waited to get done. Two of them were, of course, pro-life pieces of legislation along with pro-business, pro-economic development. And we were able to put those pieces of legislation and bring them forth, work them ahead of time so that we were ready to bring them out the very first week of session. Normally that week of session is an organ organizational week, but we took that week to make it a very uh, pro-working week for the General Assembly and pass measures for the Commonwealth of Kentucky that, you know, in years from now, we will look back on the session and, and just look at what a hallmark and remarkable session it was uh, for the people of Kentucky. Finally, while I have you, this is an EWTN program, and I understand you have met our network's foundress, the late Mother Angelica. Yes. Tell us about that. Why don't you talk us to us about oh my that? goodness, um, there were several, several times that I actually had tapes of different shows at EWTN on. Uh, different uh, capacities, but one time I was there, I was actually in the studio audience for a, sh a show that she was doing 
on stem cell. And afterwards, she was, took time you know, to, to meet everyone in the audience and, and speak to us. And you know, if you're in that audience, the whole time the show's being taped, she's really talking to not only her television network audience, but to those in the room with her. She was so energetic at a time when the doctors had told her, and she was reminding us that day that her health was waning. She was not supposed to stay long after the show, but that didn't stop Mother Angelica. She wanted to meet everyone. She wanted to talk about these issues that are so important, especially pro-life issues and the subject pro-life. So I think you know she would be so excited about this show and the work um, Pro-Life Weekly at EWTN. Thank you so much for filling us in she, on what uh, is happening in Kentucky. Kentucky State Representative Adia Wushner. Thank you, Catherine. For more reaction and analysis on pro-life legislation, we turn now to our trusted expert. Marjorie Dannenfelser is president of the Susan B. Anthony List. Marjorie, thanks for being here. I'm happy to be back, as always. Kentucky only has one abortion clinic left. They may soon have zero. How significant is this? Well, it's very significant in my view and in the long view for the pro-life movement. It's a moment where we can see vision starting to come into mm -hmm. focus. What does it mean when we start to eliminate abortion in a state or, or in our country? So with, uh, with a lack of supply of abortions, um, there may be still some demand. So how do we meet the actual need of those women who are feeling that they're in the pinch, they're in a moment where they really need so the questions of what we do in the full-blooded pro-life movement is really important at those moments. I know in Kentucky there are over 60 pregnancy care centers. Um, there are big hearts and uh, generous people there that are ready to serve. We heard some from State Representative Adia Wushner about their strategy and how they were able to get this done. What can other states learn from Kentucky? I think it's important that Governor Bevan had a vision from the beginning. As soon as he was elected, he communicated to the country in a very high-profile way that he was elected with a pro-life mandate, mm -hmm. that without the pro-life issue, he would not have been elected. Now, I, I feel sure that that is true. I know that that's true. But he was communicating that so that his legislative agenda had grease, that when he went to the, con went to the legislature and said, these are my priorities, that, uh, that there wasn't obstructionism right away. That's leadership on the executive level. And then you have the, um, the example of leadership, legislative leadership that you had on the show today mm -hmm. to make sure that that is a true partnership. And then when the pro-life movement is really working, which it is more and more now, mm -hmm. then it's filled in by the grassroots, the people who are really there to help, the people who help elect those people and the people of Kentucky who will fill in and make sure that the need is met. I think the strategy is a holistic strategy. Elections, legislation, need met. Elections, legislation, need met. And it all feeds into each other. Mm -hmm. Turning now to the federal level, mm -hmm. do you think Congress will be able to defund Planned Parenthood and what's the strategy going to be? Yes, and it's an example of the same strategy. Mm -hmm. um, elections um, were the point of commitment for the Trump administration, mm -hmm. for many of the senators that we helped elect. It mu Planned Parenthood must be defunded. There is no question we will not relent. It's taking a little bit longer. We're mm -hmm. nine months in. We hope that we would have it done by now. Mm -hmm. um, there are several avenues. It's through the reconciliation bill that only takes 50 votes. We know that it can be done. We know that we have just a few more days here in September to get that done. If for some reason it doesn't happen then, then we will go to every single measure. I spoke with Speaker Ryan, mm -hmm. and I'm going to speak with Leader McConnell um, in the coming uh, few days mm -hmm. here. And that is what I'll be communicating for the pro-life movement, that whatever avenue it takes, whether it's a spending bill, meaning we hold up the government because Planned Parenthood hasn't been defunded, um, this is nothing short of a primary mandate, and uh, there is no relenting, and we'll do it. And we will continue to watch, and we're grateful for your guidance on these issues. As always, Marjorie Dannenfelser of the Susan B. Anthony List. Thank you. Turning to this week's call to action, we need to tell our U.S. Senators to get health care reconciliation done. This may be the only way to get pro-life protections and redirect taxpayer funding away from Planned Parenthood. We have a pro-life House, Senate, and White House. We are positions like never before to make major pro-life advancements. So we need to act. Here is how you can take action and make a difference. Go to ProLifeWeekly.com 
sign on to an open letter to tell our senators to get health care reconciliation done now. It's simple. Once you go to the website, enter in your name, email address, and zip code to send your pro-life message. The letter has already been signed by national pro-life leaders, including Marjorie Dannenfelser, Tony Perkins, Lila Rose, Jeannie Mancini, Russell Moore, and more. Every day, Congress delays Planned Parenthood, aborts nearly 900 unborn children, and receives $1.5 million in taxpayer funds. We must urge our U.S. Senators to get health care reconciliation done now to get pro-life protections and redirect taxpayer funding away from Planned Parenthood. Go to ProLifeWeekly.com to sign the letter and to take your pro-life action today. Turning now to more pro-life news, Pope Francis hopes President Trump rethinks his decision to end the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, or DACA, citing a pro-life ethic. During a press conference aboard the papal plane on Sunday, the Holy Father said, I hope that it will be rethought a little, because I've heard the President of the United States speak as a pro-life man. If he is a good pro-life man, he understands that the family is the cradle of life and unity must be defended. This is what comes to me. The U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops have also been outspoken about the administration's decision calling the cancellation of DACA reprehensible in a statement. Some pro-life leaders, however, are concerned with linking immigration to the pro-life movement. Under the DACA program, eligible immigrants could receive a two-year stay on their deportation and could also be eligible for work permits and Social Security. In a statement released Tuesday, the board of the Belgian Brothers of Charity defies the Vatican and announces it will continue performing euthanasia to patients in their psychiatric centers. The Catholic group was given until the end of August to comply with the Vatican to stop performing euthanasia. Brothers of the Order were also asked to sign a joint letter to their general superior confirming adherence to church teaching. The general superior of the Belgian Brothers of Charity went to the Vatican for help in the spring when the board, made up mostly of lay members, announced it would permit euthanasia. The Catholic Catechism teaches euthanasia is morally unacceptable. In a move condemned by pro-lifers, Planned Parenthood will receive a prestigious medical research award. The Albert and Mary Lasker Foundation is honoring the abortion giant with its Public Service Award, which includes $250,000. The organization says Planned Parenthood has provided, quote, essential health services and reproductive care to millions of women for more than a century. But according to the Charlotte Lozier Institute, nearly 99% of Planned Parenthood's sexually transmitted services provide only testing, not treatment. The cancer screenings offered are insufficient to make a proper diagnosis, and besides abortion, Planned Parenthood does not provide services you can't find in an alternative health care facility. Last Saturday marked the fifth National Day of Remembrance for aborted children. Solemn prayer vigils were held at 51 grave sites across the United States and other sites dedicated to the memory of aborted children, including in Albany, New York, Bloomington, California, North Attleboro, Massachusetts, Putnam, Connecticut, and others. Pro-lifers are encouraged to carry on the spiritual mission of the Day of Remembrance by visiting grave sites of aborted children or memorials and offer prayers throughout the year. The event was organized by Citizens for a Pro-Life Society, Priests for Life, and the Pro-Life Action League. A California judge rules a teenage girl declared brain dead more than three years ago may technically still be alive. Jahi McMath suffered brain damage and is connected to a ventilator after a tonsillectomy in 2013. The judge's ruling last week allows a malpractice lawsuit against the hospital to move forward, meaning McMath's care could be paid for if the family succeeds. A doctor stated in court that videos recorded by McMath's family from 2014 to 2016 show the girl is still alive but is in a minimally responsive state. We will have much more on this case next week with top bioethics expert Wesley J. Smith. A UK politician does not back down from his pro-life views. Take a look at this. What's your view of abortion? I'm completely opposed to abortion. Life begins at the point of conception. So why are you on abortion? Are you completely opposed different. to abortion in all circumstances? Um, yes, I am. Rape and incest? Sexual violence? I'm afraid so. That is Member of Parliament Jacob Rees-Mogg boldly defending his pro-life views on British television after being pressed on how his Catholic faith 
influences his beliefs. He was also questioned about his views on marriage being a sacrament between one man and one woman. Rees Mogg is a likely candidate for Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. We want to bring you an update on a story we first brought you two weeks ago. Carrie DeCline, a woman who turned down cancer treatment to save her unborn baby, has died just three days after the child was delivered. DeCline died last Saturday at age 37, leaving behind her husband of 17 years and her six children. Her youngest baby was delivered last week at 24 weeks and five days, weighing one pound and four ounces. The family has named the newborn child Life. Let us all continue to pray for the repose of Carrie's soul and for the entire DeCline family. You may have heard it before, a common line used to undermine the pro-life movement, that pro-lifers are only pro-birth. But our next guest alone busts that misconception. Susan Gallucci is a licensed clinical social worker and executive director of the Northwest Center, a Washington, D.C.-based group that runs both a pregnancy center and a maternity home. Susan, thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. First off, your group is just one of the many examples of the hard work pro-lifers are committed to across the country. Can you give us a rundown of what happens at the Northwest Center? Certainly. So we've been in existence since 1981. We were founded by Georgetown students and alumni. We started with the Pregnancy Center program. So we offer free urine-based pregnancy tests and sit down with the women to do what we call options counseling, go through their options when they're ha facing the unplanned pregnancy. And then in 1993, we opened the maternity home program. So we offer a transitional housing program for women who are pregnant, often kicked out of their house due to their pregnancy, where they can come and stay and and have the baby get on their feet and transition to independence. So we're a small townhouse in northwest DC. In the basement level is our pregnancy center. We also see more than 100 families a month and help them with diapers and baby clothes and a listening ear and parenting skills, connecting them to resources. And then we house four or five women and their babies in the upstairs of the townhome. This is truly care for women in need. And you say it takes a village to care for these women. What do you mean by that? It really does, thinking about having a baby, having all those extra people, and I say to the moms as they're there by themselves, if people are planning to have a baby, there's the wife, there's the husband, there's the in-laws, there's the neighbors, mm -hmm. and so we really want to create that support. Who's going to be there to give them a break in the middle of the night or to just hold the baby while they fix a meal? And also as the baby gets older, to watch the baby if the baby's sick and can't go to daycare but they have to go to work or go to school, um, and to provide all those extra supports that a family would provide. Now you are a licensed clinical social worker. What kind of insight does that give you as you're caring for and encountering these women? I think it really gives me the skill set to be able to listen, to be able to look at, in social work, we say person and environment. What's going on with them psychologically, emotionally, physically, especially as they're entering right. pregnancy, and say, what do they need? Where can, we give, can I give them the space to really talk about what's going on so they can choose life? There's so many pressures there, so how can we give them that space to think about choosing life for the baby and letting them know what resources are there and really letting them know that we care both for the woman and for the child, both in that moment of crisis but beyond as well. That's so well said. Now as someone who is so committed and dedicated to the pro-life cause, when you hear that common misunderstanding, that common myth that pro-lifers are only pro-birth, what's your response to that? I look at, for example, what the Pope just said about being pro-life means being pro-family. And I think if people step back and really look at pro-lifers and what we're doing, yes, you need people on all the lines. You need the legislative aspect. You need the people at the abortion clinics praying so the women who walk in can see them and know they have alternatives. And you need the people beyond. The women who live in the maternity home come back after they leave, when their child's two, when their child's three, to say how they're doing, to ask for help, just to check in. And I think it's that to say, I'm proud of you. Look what I'm doing. Look how far I've come. Sounds like you're really creating this community for these women so that after they give birth, there is still support that is there. Absolutely. And again, it's looking at what's that whole picture. And again, you need people at every stage, but we're helping women until the children are two and a half with diapers, with other items. And again, with housing for a year and a half or a little longer if they need it. Thank you for all the work that you are doing. I really mean that. Susan Gallucci, Executive Director of the Northwest Center. Thank you so much.
when we come back. Even though we call ourselves modern mobile medicine, in many ways, we're going back to the way medicine used to be. We introduce you to a doctor who is rethinking how we receive healthcare, and you might find it's more pro-family and life-affirming. Stay tuned as EWTM Pro-Life Weekly continues after this break. Welcome back to EWTM Pro-Life Weekly. I'm Katherine Seltner. In this week's Speak Out segment, we want to address a video that's been gaining more attention online recently. The video shows an interview with actress Martha Plimpton, where she tells the audience about her first abortion at age 19. Take a look. I also had my first abortion at the Seattle Planned Parenthood. Yay! Notice I said first, I said first, and I don't want Seattle, I don't want you guys to feel insecure. It was my best one. <laughs> you can hear the audience cheering at the Shout Your Abortion event. Plimpton is being interviewed by Dr. Willie Parker, an abortionist who has said he believes he is doing God's work. This video was recorded back in June. The cheers, the laughing, the complete disregard for human life as captured in this video is unsettling. And we as pro-lifers need to respond to this with prayer. We need to pray for Martha Plimpton's children who were killed at their most vulnerable state. We need to pray for Martha and all post-abortive mothers that they may come to understand the extent of their actions, seek forgiveness, and be embraced with healing and mercy. And we need to pray for those of us in the pro-life movement that we may be guided with the right words and actions when we encounter women considering abortions. This is also another wake-up call to us that pro-abortion groups are no longer interested in abortions being safe, legal, and rare. They are convincing women abortions are like a badge of honor, something to be proud of, shout about, and laugh at. We want you to know, if you are post-abortive and dealing with the grief that is involved, you are not alone. Go to HopeAfterAbortion.com. There is support out there and a lot of people praying for you. Remember, there is something you can do to counter today's culture of death. Go to ProLifeWeekly.com. Tell U.S. Senators to get health care reconciliation done now because this may be the only way to get pro-life protections and redirect taxpayer funding away from Planned Parenthood. As we wait for Congress to act on health care reform, one D.C. area doctor is pushing for a completely alternative approach to how we receive health care. She claims the future of medicine means bringing it back to basics. Here is this week's Pro-Life Focus. You know, even though we call ourselves modern mobile medicine, in many ways, we're going back to the way medicine used to be. Dr. Marguerite Duane doesn't have a physical clinic. But with her medical knowledge and skills and what she dubs her mom mobile, Duane takes her life affirming direct primary medical care on the road. Since the patient is paying directly, I'm working for the patient. So I'm not thinking, what do I need to do in this visit so that I can bill the insurance company so the insurance company can pay me. Modern mobile okay, medicine patients pay like Dr. Duane a monthly right. fee, like a cell phone bill, to get access to her. Whether it's for an in-person visit, an over-the-phone question, or even a Skype consultation. John Reardon works for the State Department, but before taking off for Molly, he meets with Dr. Duane for a minor surgical procedure. We really like the, uh, the convenience, of course, of not having to go to the doctor's office to receive medical care. But more importantly is the, uh, the relationship that we're building um, over time. Dr. Duane um, serves anyone of any religion, but being a Catholic, Reardon says his wife is grateful the D.C. doctor can understand the importance of their family's faith. He really very much appreciates not having our faith, you know, questioned or even, you know, she's being made to feel uncomfortable about particular things like, of course, our, our um, decision to use NFP. Patients don't need to travel and wait in line for Dr. Duane's medical services. She drives straight to them, like an old-fashioned house call. How are you? Good. How are you doing? Good. Yes, thank you. Being a direct primary medical care giver, Dr. Duane isn't dependent on low insurance reimbursements. 
This means she sees fewer patients each day compared to most doctors and can get to know her patients more personally, including the four Lindquist children ages four and under. You know what makes you beautiful? What's inside of you? Jesus makes you beautiful. She checks up on the children in the comfort of their own home. Can you do that? Whoa, lift it up. Awesome. And in the comfort of their mother's arms. The young patients offer their reviews. Benny, what do you make of having a doctor come to the house? Not so sure, huh? While the four-year-old boy isn't certain, his mother, Kelly Lindquist, is sold on the direct primary care model. When you have sick kids and they're tired, they don't want to get out of bed or be removed from where they're comfortable, and you have to take them all to a doctor's office where, again, other sick kids have been, and then they're, like, maybe you have some healthy kids, and then they get sick with this other thing, and then you're, it's like a never-ending process. Dr. Duane recommends families rethink their health care coverage and only opt for catastrophic health insurance to cover the unexpected expensive costs or join a health sharing ministry like CMF Cura if they want direct primary care. Family is the foundation of our society. And if your family is not well, physically, emotionally, spiritually, how can we be functioning members of our society and give back? So it really restores that doctor-patient relationship. So for me as a doctor, I am working to take care of you and your needs. And obviously your most important need is your life and your well-being. And my goal is to make sure you're living the best, healthiest life possible. For this doctor, the future of pro-life family medicine means better health care for the home in the home. All right, we'll see All right. you soon. Bye. Very soon. If you and your family are interested in having a direct primary care doctor like Dr. Duane, you can find the closest doctor to you at dpcare.org. Some states have more direct primary care doctors than others, but it's still worth a search. That's it for this edition of EWTM Pro-Life Weekly. You can reach us anytime with questions, ideas, comments at prolifeweekly at ewtn.com. I look forward to seeing you here again next week. Life is a gift. Your life is a gift. God bless.